Welcome to the Startup Grind. Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to Startup Grind. Uh, just by show of hands, who's been to a Startup Grind event before? Okay, great. Uh, so we used to hold these uh, monthly uh, interviews with startup founders around a year ago, and then we went on a break. Uh, but now we're back, and hopefully you can expect to see monthly events with founders. And the point of Startup Grind, so Startup Grind is a global community of startup entrepreneurs and enthusiasts, uh, and it's based on local events. And I'm sure some of you have thought the idea, this will never work in Kuwait. Uh, that, this is the main problem we're trying to address. It can work in Kuwait. It can work in the local community that you're a part of. Startup Grind has three main values, as we've highlighted here. Make friends, not contacts. So it's not about networking. It's about making, building genuine relationships with other people. Uh, giving, not taking. You're being part of a community and you need to be generous with your time, with your effort, with your attention. And helping others before helping yourself. Don't seek your own interests when engaging with other people. See what, in what ways you can c contribute to them and this will uh, come back to, uh, to benefit you in the future. I'm thrilled to have Anwal Rafa'i with us today. Uh, I've known her since her early days in building her business and today we'll talk more about the transitions she had to go through, the struggles, the successes, and the, I'm sure there are many lessons to learn from Anwar. Thank you for joining us, Anwar. Thank you for having me. Okay. I should have raised my hand. I, was, I attended a few as well. <laughs> nice, thank you. Uh, okay, so uh, to start off with, uh, can you tell us from the early uh, days of P5M, how did it begin as an idea, and where did you reach so far? So with P5M, uh, we started off as a running group. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the whole reason was basically that there was something, uh, a value for us in being active in a social way that coming back uh, to the region we couldn't find. So we decided to, to take the initiative to make this uh, happen for ourselves. Okay, so just to clarify, who's yes. we? We, uh, me and my co-founder. Okay. Uh, so he actually started the running group. Okay. And I joined when I used to come uh, back from the States when I was uh, studying abroad. Okay. So, um, and then uh, at some point, uh, the initiation of the studio came about at Al Hamra, which is a, was an open space uh, for people uh, like trainers to book the and rent the space whenever they're available and for the community to kind of see what w uh, classes were being offered and depending on their availability, drop by or uh, without having any commitments. Okay, so running group yes. and then studio. Yes. Still no mention of, of an app. Right. And did you have an app in mind then or... Did yes. that develop? Okay. Or with the studio, we had an app in mind. Okay. But the running group, no. Uh, it was uh, basically a need that we've, we had, and we opened it up for the society and to see if they're interested or if this is actually something they would like to join. But there was no business in mind. There was uh, nothing in mind more than sharing uh, the love of being active okay. at the time. So with the studio, what we had in mind is to kind of again, validate the idea of the app. Okay. Because, of course, to me and to my co-founder, it was an amazing idea. I'd love to go and try out different gyms, uh, especially that a lot of them I really love. But, okay, I love boxing at the hook, for example, but I also really like yoga. So, and I want to do that at Daratma, for example. Okay. But there's, there was no way to connect them. So in our mind, this was a great idea, but we still needed to validate it. So that's where the studio came in. So it was basically just an opportunity for us to understand what a gym goes through operationally, uh, okay. what attracts people. Would they like this lack of commitment? Because uh, it's very new. And when we did start P5M and the studio, there was no uh, membership that was class-based. Okay. All memberships were time-based. You either did three months, six, or 12. Okay. Just, uh, just so we're sure that the audience understands what P5M is oh, now. Yeah. Yes. So it's basically an app where you uh, get a single membership that gives you access to multiple gyms. So this is where it is 
as it stands right now. And then now we're talking about the history of the app itself. Yeah. So at the time, uh, this uh, concept of only buying classes and mm. not time was, very, was new. Uh, uh, gyms weren't used to it, people weren't used to it, so we, we wanted to see if it would work. So uh, we had the studio, and people, like I said, would purchase one class, five, 10, or 15, or unlimited mm. classes, and use them whenever they, they, uh, they had the time. And that kind of validated the idea for us. People were very interested. They loved the lack of commitment, uh, especially if they weren't sure what they wanted. They liked okay. kind of exploring. So uh, after that, uh, we slowly opened up uh, the other gyms and the idea that we are that we have now. So initially, we didn't wait until uh, all the gyms were on board or a minimum amount of gyms were on board. We literally launched with the studio and then we announced that there was one added gym uh, to the P5M membership and then two added gyms and three and oh. so forth. So there, uh, we never really uh, like moved in, you can say, um, after the house was built. Okay. We, we did room by room, and, and then we were like, oh, actually, we need a kitchen, and we need uh, a, a bathroom. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> uh, So that was kind of our process. Okay, uh, which is very interesting for me, because uh, your business model or your platform is a multi-sided platform. Yes. It's dependent on gyms as well mm -hmm. as gym goers. Mm -hmm. And usually within that model, there's the problem of what's known as the chicken and the egg problem. Which, which uh, side of the business do you start with? Do you start with the gyms or do you start with the gym goers? So you managed to kind of break out of that by having your own studio and then launching with that. Exactly. Excellent. Uh, and, and that's a great point because uh, they really balance each other out. Uh, even now, there's a lot of gyms that come on board and then they close or there is certain issues so they can't continue. Mm. And uh, we just... Uh, the, the people bring in the gyms and the gyms bring on the people and it's kind of like a balance. Okay. Yeah. So, and then uh, after that, after the studio? Uh, uh, and then happened? we started adding gyms on board okay. and now we have an application where uh, we only have gyms and uh, not a physical platform for ourselves okay. uh, where users can have one membership and go to any of the gyms on board. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and uh, in terms of, just so we can have a clear timeline and yes. then we'll dive deeper into it. Uh, in terms of investing, when did that come into the picture? So initially, uh, when I stepped in as a, as a co-founder for the mm -hmm. application, I put in my investment. Okay. And then we had an angel investor. And after that, an institutional investor which okay. brought in uh, a lot of uh, what they call a smart investment. Okay. So it, it's not just uh, monetary, but it also comes with uh, skills and network and added value. Okay, that's uh, 500 startups. Yes. Okay, because I want to ask you more specific questions sure. about that. Uh, but again, just in terms of timeline, uh, when did the institutional investment come into the picture? So uh, how many... Yes. Uh, months or years were you operating before getting that investment? So the studio, we were operating it for a year before okay. the app launched uh, with oh. one gym, one added gym and our studio. And after that, the institutional investment came in a year after that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and so that's the investment side. And then uh, building your team, how did that sort of develop? So that's a really good question uh, because I feel like when building a team, there's so much growth that you have to go through and uh, personally and uh, professionally. Yeah. So uh, for me personally, I would say that building the team, I had to really uh, uh, value the, the, the kind of like co-working environment to be able to trust, delegate, and understand what it is that I need team members to do. So initially, I did start off uh, with um, one team member, uh, myself and my co-founder, uh, ma mainly to kind of delve into each department and understand it fully before I can really have someone on board because I can't go have an interview and not knowing what it is that person is going to be doing. Uh, okay, yes. Uh, so having a good foundation before you hire someone is very important. 
uh, I went through that mistake um, starting off with someone and the, the job description kept changing, the, the, you know, the investment that they had to put, the requirements kept changing and, and you would hear things like, yeah, but we never, I, I never had to do this before. Uh, you know, like, oh, since when do we have to do this? And it's like, w this is a startup. The nature of a startup is that it's always growing and adapting and, and evolving. Okay. So but uh, they didn't feel comfortable in their role because it wasn't clearly defined. Exactly. That's the problem. Exactly. Okay. So when we were defining it, adding spreadsheets where you had to input information and all that, it was new and it felt like it's not my job. You know what okay. I mean? So, uh, so understanding it and having a system in place helps a lot when, you, when you're hiring someone because they'll really be clear at, uh, as what you expect from them and, uh, and where you're going. So now when I'm hiring someone or talking to someone, I always tell them, oh, by the way, this can change. We're a startup, we're adaptable, and we evolve, like I said, so be prepared for things to change. Okay. Uh, and are you comfortable with that? So, and then, okay, and then you, you're even hiring the right type of people. So, okay. uh, so and then, uh, just to answer your question, um, it started off with the core th uh, value that we're offering our users, which is the classes and the, the product, the application. These things, of course, we hire early on and we hire very strong people that are capable of doing that. Uh, meaning the development team? A development okay. team and uh, people that can uh, like do inventory and all that jazz. Okay. Yeah. So uh, the data. Yeah, yeah. the da okay. the, uh, the data. Okay. So um, the things that are not core in our business, for example, like accounting, uh, it's not some one of our core values or the services we provide. Mm. Those things, uh, I think, are a good idea for you to start and look in and do it yourself to understand the process before even outsourcing it. Like you don't necessarily need a team member in house to be doing something like that. Okay. if it's not a core service or value that you're providing in your business. Okay. So having that understanding is also very important. Yeah, so now you have a development team. Yes. Accounting is outsourced. Yes. What else? What does P5M from the inside look like? So if we have marketing, okay. data, quality, and, uh, so th and, that's, and of course IT development. The, okay. those, all of those are in-house because they keep changing and it's literally our our core, core value. Okay. And where did you find your team members? And uh, what do you yeah. look for as well? That's, uh, that's a very good question. So in terms of uh, the development, mm. uh, of, like it starts off uh, with kind of having someone that understands uh, IT and, uh, you know, hardware and software. And from that, they build off the team. They, uh, starting with, of course, uh, people that you know, like references. Okay. Uh, because most likely the people that you interact with uh, know exactly the, uh, the type of person that you need and or kind of have the same network uh, of people that would add value to you. Mm. So the, the best hires we've ever made were those that were referred. Okay. So yeah. you hire someone yes. uh, who sort of takes the lead in a certain aspect of the business. Exactly. So some, for development, you have someone, and then for marketing. Exactly, and so exactly. Okay. And especially, like, uh, our team is in India. So there, uh, they have different uh, strategies of, like, um, recruiting and HR and different platforms. Yeah. So if you do hire someone that understands what people need and how to build a good culture w uh, in the company there then they'll be able to have, build the, the right infrastructure and hire the right team. Okay. Yeah. Nice. Uh, and when it comes to uh, communicating the values, like you said, you, uh, your team members need to know that startups are agile and things will change. How do you communicate these values? Do you have like posters all over the place? or? So um, like? this is something kind of new that we're building yeah. uh, and hiring new people to kind of have that company culture. But we have a policy that I always start with saying 
uh, outlining exactly what we expect, yeah. what the employee expects from me and what I expect from the employee, the, like both ways. Yeah. So that is something that translates into everything, every relationship, whether it's within the team, it's with a partner gym or with our users. That clear communication is very important because when people get what they they expect and you have that transparency, it, uh, it builds better connections, long lasting connections. Okay. So let me give, for example, that's also something I learned from a mentor at uh, 500 MISC. Yeah. Uh, he's an amazing sales um, man. Yeah. And uh, he's, he's like a magician. But when you talk to him and you learn his methods, it's not magic. It's literally clear expectations and honesty. So for him, he sells what he has. He doesn't oversell, and a lot of times uh, there's a misconception in marketing where you like use flashy words like uh, we're the best or we have everything and we, all the gyms. Like multiple times people have told me within my marketing uh, strategy, no, like think about it. If someone says all gyms, it sounds so much better than if someone says multiple gyms or the best gyms. And it's like, but that's the reality. You're not yeah. going to open the application and see all gyms because our value is that there is good quality gyms on board. So I kept pushing and I said, no, we're going to say multiple or we're going to say best because we did thoroughly kind of, um, uh, we thoroughly, looked into each and every one of those gyms on board to make sure that they adhere to the quality that we're promising our users. Mm. Uh, and that, I think, is the best type of marketing or sales uh, and the best way to attract the right leads, whether it's teammates or gyms or users, is to be transparent and, uh, and kind of uh, have uh, uh, the right claim. Okay, so... Making promises you can keep yes. and then setting the right expectations exactly. for them. Okay. Uh, there's uh, something that I learned actually from your startup boot camp oh. uh, was about expectations. Oh, sorry, one more time? <laughs> it, trust me, it's going to come up okay. multiple <laughs> times. <laughs> so um, that, the expectations. That if basically if you want ratings and you want feedback from your users that are positive, then you have to exceed their expectation. So if you basically meet their expectation, it'll be neutral and they'll be happy and they're going to continue using your service. But it's only when you exceed expectation when you get positive feedback because it's like, oh my God, this, like, you know, this was way better than I expected. Mm. And if you underperform uh, or you don't uh, give your users what they expect or what you promise them, then you have negative feedback where the, it's kind of like, well, I expected a good gym. Why am I going to this class and it's like smelly or, you know, something? Yani it's not the best as you claimed. So that's why it's, it's very important uh, for long-term relationships yeah. um, rather than short, uh, high turnover kind of relationships where even gyms come on board and leave, uh, same with users and same with, with uh, teammates. Yeah. Um, so when it comes to exceeding expectations or uh, setting a quality standard, you're kind of dependent on what the gyms provide. So going back to the idea of a smelly gym, yes, uh, I, I would guess that this is part of the selection. You, you're yes. choosing ch uh, gyms that uh, do offer quality services. Uh, but at the same time, do you get involved? So when a customer complains about a gym, uh, yes, of course. Facilitate. Okay. Yeah, just if to go talk, a little yeah. bit. Yeah, of course. Just to go back a little bit, uh, in terms of like controlling or the um, the quality and yeah. I, uh, the thing is that starts from the beginning. So our vision is basically to create a uh, a more active lifestyle. Um, my background was in psychology, so mental health is something that's very important to me. And I feel like physical activity is something that complements mental health. Mm. Uh, either or, like if anyone is like me, it's easier to control my body than it is to control my mind. Mm. So a lot of the, the lessons that I've learned in my life come from the lessons I've learned being active in class or part of a team in school. So I wanted that kind of um, learning to be accessible to the to people in the community, 
uh, there's something that I once read where it's it's like moving people from dependency from the world to to being uh, independent of changing that world. So you feel like you have the confidence and the the skills that you're able to make any change that you want to see within your community. Okay. Um, I, I don't know, like, correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like sometimes females in the community don't have the opportunity, or at least that was my experience, to do, to do something on their own, which is, alhamdulillah, but sometimes it's good to have that independence to do something on your own without support of friends or family. Uh, like one example is, uh, I love when a few of my users say this to me, was that one woman uh, was like, I didn't want to go into class alone because that's not something I'm um, yeah, familiar with. I'm not yeah. familiar of doing things independently from others. So I'd like to drag my friend with me or يعني, somehow have someone with me when I'm entering in class. But after a while, no, actually, it's, it's kind of like, this is her words, literally. She's like, I'm thinking, what? What do you mean I had to bring someone in class with me? Like, yeah. يعني, I can walk into class. It, it's not something that requires someone else to come with you to do it. And f- feeling that confidence to, to make to do something on your own leaks into every other aspect of life. And one big thing that I hope will uh, come out of it is being able to, if you see something that you are unhappy with, to be confident in, in making that change instead of you know, feeling that someone else should be doing it or it's someone else's responsibility to take accountability into creating the world that you want to see. Nice. So... so you not only see it as an opportunity for people to improve their fitness or their health, there's actually like a character building yeah. sort of taking place. As, as you commit to an exercise routine, you're, you're changing your perspective about what you're capable of achieving. Definitely. Like okay. for a few examples is when you do start a class, the first class is so hard. But mm. after, after some time, it gets really easy. So something clicks in your mind where you're like, oh, it, the hardest part was starting. So you can just imagine having that realization and having that perspective doing other things in your life. Yeah. And then maybe I just have to start and I'll just get better from there. Um, also per- persevering. Mm. Like the first time I couldn't do, obviously, a push-up. But after a time, I can do 10 easily without breaking, which, mm. sorry for people that can do more than that, <laughs> mm. but still working on it. Uh, but just knowing that, okay, if I persevere, uh, it's going to take time. It's not a straight line. One day I'm feeling amazing and I do 20. And then there's another day I can't even do three. Mm. So these kind of learnings that come with, fi- with going to a class and physical activity is extremely uh, power- uh, powerful tools that people can take with them anywhere. Nice. Uh, actually, m- one of my favorite uh, quotes is, uh, the longest part of the journey is said to be the passing of the gate. So th- that's Definitely. the thing that we struggle with the most. And yes. then one, once you overcome that, then you realize you can accomplish so much. Exactly. Uh, but when it comes to the app, yeah. w- how do you and actually encourage people to, to take that first step? Yes. Like, so about the gyms that you were talking yeah. about. So having that vision in mind, we partner up with those kind of gyms that also have that vision that they want to make a fitness accessible because it's important to them. Yeah. And it's important to have people be healthy in I the long run. see a few instructors in oh, the I hope so. <laughs> so uh, when you do work with these kind of gyms, they are patient. They're patient mm. with users when they cancel. They're patient with us- users when they're late. So they we we foster and kind of meet people where, where they are mm. and their commitment level bef- before building kind of um, and having them commit to being fit. Uh, so those, so generally we don't really need to really oversee the gym so much because having that connection and goal in mind uh, makes the, the relationship so much better. Nice. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, so your background is in psychology. Yes. And this is your first entrepreneurial venture? Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm interested in knowing to what extent your background in psychology is feeding into the app and what doubts did you experience about actually starting 
the business itself? Uh, that's a good question. So one, to be honest, when it came to starting the business, I never thought of it as I'm starting the business. I thought of it as in I came back from abroad, was working, and I was very frustrated because I couldn't really find a, a class or a gym. Or if I did, I didn't want to do one activity all the time. Like I, I like changing it up when I'm angry. I want to box. Uh, sometimes when I'm anxious, I want to, you know, meditate in yoga. So it depends on how I'm feeling. I want to do different activities. Yeah. But I didn't find something like that. So I literally, after work, would kind of go uh, and do some research. What's available? Who can help me maybe set up a website or something where I can do it? So I wasn't thinking of other people doing it as much as myself. Yeah. But one step came uh, at a time. Uh, until I found myself, okay, uh, a lot of people need this, and uh, yeah, I mean, we can kind of, I can not only do it for myself and make the change that I want to see, but also I can make it for everyone in my community. Okay, so you were thinking of it in terms of solving your own problem yes. and then solving it for other people, but not as... I'm now becoming an entrepreneur. No, I never thought of it like that. Like I'm gonna start a business, or I'm gonna. No, I thought of okay. I want to do. I want to make this change, mm. and I believe that I can with the right support, and that the community needs it. Okay. Yeah. And now being part of the entrepreneurial uh, community, so being an insider, what uh, misconceptions or what impressions did you have? from the outside looking in that yeah. now you realize are not true or oh, they're glad. destructive? So one misconception that I really want to uh, break for any entrepreneur in the audience is uh, having to work 24-7. That's the hugest misconception. You don't have to be working from the moment you open your eyes to the moment you close them. And mm. actually that's going to hurt you in the long run. Uh, so there is a, a law that uh, Parkinson's law. Parkinson's law. Parkinson's law. Yeah. Uh, Parkinson's. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Never mind. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Parkinson's law, which says if if you allot space or time, you're going to fill that time. So basically, having the 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 kind of idea that I'm going to work all day means you're actually going to work all day. You're not going to be efficient. Uh, you're going to think like, oh, if I can't do it now, I can do it in five hours from now. But once, when you set a timeline for yourself, like eight to five or eight to six, you're, you're going to be efficient because you know once that clock strikes five, you're going to leave. And not only is this good uh, in order to, not, to be efficient, but it also is great to prevent uh, burnout because this is literally... Uh, really, uh, this is a marathon. This is not a sprint. You're not going to make the app and then just chill and, and everything's going to fall into place. If anything, a, a lot of the things that you thought would be super successful might end up being like, yani, has no value at all. And I can give one example. Yeah, please. Uh, that when I started, I said, oh my God, I think if we have a wish list where people can kind of bookmark the classes they're interested in joining, it would be amazing. Like everyone is going to want to use it because there's so many classes. So sometimes, you know, you want to look back. Mm. No one used it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. ف, يعني, things aren't what... Uh, you would expect sometimes but mm. the more you kind of get into the hang of things the more you go through and you kind of have that relationship with the user the smarter your assumptions are going to be so in the beginning يعني, your assumptions just to keep in mind might be completely wrong but with time like any relationship you're going to understand and be able to kind of predict your partner or your user's um, uh, needs um, so that's one misconception and as I said it's good for being more efficient for uh, preventing burnout so you can really do this long for the long haul and one thing is that it, it improves your features you can sit there and stare at the data and stare at uh, all the work all day but nothing uh, makes uh, uh, building something for life better than actually living life. You have to have a lot that time after work to be part of the community. 
uh, that to actually experience the problems exactly that your because, users are facing. Yeah. yeah. When you do start, your intuition is so important because you are a user. I am what I'm building, or the need that I need is is what I'm building. But after a while, when you're in the office and you're yeah, any kind of grinding, you can say you lose touch. Way, <coughs> sorry, uh, you lose touch of reality. Yeah, and mm. what is it that users want? What is the experience now of the average person? Shwaya, you lose touch of that. But having that, مثلا, nine to five hours uh, in the day of working and then the rest of the time living allows you to have that insight back into a user's uh, everyday average life. Uh, I go to classes and so I look at the experience, I talk to people at the gyms, I talk to my friends uh, who are diverse in... Um, and how they live life, either mothers, working professionals, um, people that are uh, not here permanently and go abroad and come back. So being able to be in touch with, um, with the community is actually going to help you, even though in your mind you're like, oh my God, يعني, okay, I'm leaving at five, but th this needs to be sent and this needs to be done. In the long term, it will add to the success of your business, even though yeah. short term it might not seem like it. Yeah, uh, I, based on my own uh, personal experience, when I used to do uh, programming, I would get stuck with like a bug I didn't know how to fix. And then when I step away from work and then come back to it, I immediately uh, spot the problem exactly. and fix it. Yeah. So, and uh, there's also the author, uh, Dan Pink, he wrote uh, Drive and a few other books. Uh, he says uh, his best ideas come from transitions between activities. So, so true. climbing the stairs, preparing his coffee, that's where he, get, he gets his best ideas uh, from. Uh, definitely. And I, I do encourage it with, for myself and my teammates to go, and, go out and experience things and experience the app. And actually, not just within your uh, particular field, like fitness or health, but sometimes like multi uh, have a kind of overall view into different disciplines because that can also foster creativity when mm. you see other kind of lawyers engineers different type of people and their problem solving skills it triggers uh, um a solution for your own problem. One that actually might be more creative than if you're just focusing on your particular field. Because surprise, yeah, and he, you'd be surprised that to, to make a change, you need to do, uh, you need to actually do something different. Um, or what's the, the saying? If you want things to be different, then do something different, something, sorry, don't quote me. No, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, you can't solve, uh, you can't uh, solve problems with the same mindset that started them that started exactly them. so if you want to really make a, a change in the industry that you're in maybe pull up pull out ideas from different industries because no one had no one thought of of that before <laughs> you're doing something completely different within the industry but yeah. could be effective yeah uh, there's also i would recommend a book called the medici effect uh, for this because uh, the book highlights how most innovation uh, occurs from people that come from a different discipline. Exactly. That come with fresh eyes, with a new perspective, yes. and uh, yeah. are able to innovate. And that goes, uh, that goes towards hiring as well. So I know that yeah, any, when people hire, especially here, they look at certificates. That's super important. Like, what did you study? What certificates do you have? But nothing is more valuable than experience. Uh, and, and that's why when I interview someone uh, or I, I don't judge them based on the CV, I talk to them and I, and I kind of want to see that, uh, that spark, that like hunger for learning. I want to learn, I want to improve. When you see that, no matter what discipline they're in, if you put them in, in this position, they're going to learn quickly and they're going to be efficient in that role. Mm. Um, so... And they're more adaptable. Sorry, I know I'm saying and and. So they're way more adaptable. So that whole uh, fast pace, evolving nature of a startup, they're going to be able to really excel in it because they don't have any like fixed uh, mindset on what it is I'm supposed to do. Yeah, I studied marketing and this is marketing and this is what I studied and this is what my professor told me. And therefore, uh, this is what I, I have to do. 
uh, without without like questioning the process. Mm. Where someone new coming in that being a little naive makes them open to learning. Yeah. And I think that's something that you always have to keep with you even as an entrepreneur, even uh, and when uh, kind of hiring uh, team members. Yeah. They need to have that... Um, They're able to like question your assumptions, yes. the, the business's assumptions. And question everything and never feel like I know everything. You know, no, yeah. يعني, I think that hurts you more than it benefits you. Yeah. Because that way it hinders your growth. If you, f- if you have that mindset that, oh my God, I have so much to learn, you're going to keep learning. You're going to keep digging. You're going to keep talking and asking. But if you have that mindset, well, I'm amazing. I know everything. Then you're, you're not helping yourself because you, you're not going to have that hunger to learn something new. Nice. Yeah. Um, I want to delve <laughs> a bit deeper into some aspects of the business. Sure. Yeah. But before that, I'd like to ask you about your experience being part of the MISC Accelerator Program. Yes. So uh, that was uh, part of the 500 startups uh, investment. Yes. And I believe you were the only Kuwaiti startup uh, that was part yeah. of the, the batch. Okay. Yes. Uh, can you tell us a bit more about what you learned from the Accelerator Program? What were the key learnings yeah. from it? So I'll sum them up before like talking a little bit about them. So yeah. one is uh, being uh, able to easily uh, kind of uh, move around. Uh, and that's not only physically, but also mentally. To be uh, more um, like, uh, I, I'm going to say light for the lack of a better word. Um, agile, maybe. Yeah, agile. Okay, thank you. Okay, no problem. <laughs> Should definitely uh, brush up on my vocabulary. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so, for example, um, when, uh, when I entered the program or got accepted in it, it was literally f- maybe four days before I had to travel to Saudi Arabia, Saudi, Saudi Arabia and lived there for uh, a month and, and more. So that kind of, خلاص, I have no option, you have to get up, you have to pack and you have to leave and build a new comfort zone somewhere else. Mm. That was one of the most valuable lessons even before I entered the program. Because being able to pick up and leave made me feel like I can literally go anywhere. I can do anything. Uh, yeah. Instead of being in the office all the time or being uh, kind of um, tethered to a location. You, you mean the fact that it wasn't held in Kuwait? Yeah. That alone made a difference? Exactly. Okay, interesting. Uh, and the, the, the short notice. Okay. Yeah, and it literally, it was like a few days and I had to pack everything, tell my parents. <laughs> That was intense. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, just get on a plane and go there for uh, a month, not yeah. knowing where I was going to live. Of, yani, I had to plan that in four days. Uh, what, how's the transportation and all that? So being able to do that made me feel like I can go anywhere. I can go explore how the community is in, uh, in for example, Bahrain. I can go to uh, Lebanon. I can go everywhere because I know that I've already done it and, and it's possible. So that kind of feeling of يعني, like being able to move easily yeah. also, also translates into my working environment here. So now okay. instead of being in the uh, in the office all the time and thinking, oh, uh, I'll go to this gym another time, or it's it's such a hassle to make like uh, visits and and uh, that sort of thing. No, I'm I feel light, like I can make multiple meetings and go and check out here and there easily because خلاص, I'm not uh, I got over that comfort zone. Mm. Which is interesting because before the program. It was only you holding yourself back. Yes, exactly. And then that experience just allowed you to step out of that. Exactly. Uh, those r- uh, constraints. Exactly. Okay. And uh, so the substance of the program itself, how yeah. was it structured? What did you cover? That's another thing. So one thing that I learned about the structure of the program is the importance of balancing learning and applying what you've learned. Okay. Uh, I feel like a lot of people get caught up in like, actually in one of your newsletters, you've mentioned mm. this. Uh, so if you ha- don't follow, follow, hashtag uh, not paid ad. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, basically, you said something about buckets. Okay. And that there's a bucket where you put in all the information you've learned. And then there's a bucket of you actually applying what you've learned. Uh, 
and that's exactly how the entire program was structured. Mm. In the morning, you would have lectures uh, based on different departments, sales, marketing, uh, finance, um, legal, etc. And then in the afternoon, you had to apply that knowledge. You had to go back to the team, see how you're going to implement it, and without having too much time to think about it. How can I apply it now and then build off of that? Very similar to how P5M itself started. So a lot of these processes are actually, it's one process that you do for everything. Yeah, and let's take the funnel, for example. Okay. Uh, the, um, who's aware of the marketing funnel? So basically there's a funnel where uh, whenever you do anything, you start from the top, like awareness, and you go all the way down to your, the target or the goal that you want to set. And that's the same with everything, with mm. getting gyms on board, with uh, where you want the, um, uh, with where you want the company to be in the future, uh, marketing, sales, everything. Yeah. Um, so and learning, you have all the, the the information that you have, and then you slowly kind of actually apply it towards a goal. Yeah. So most processes have multiple phases yes and and that model on it on its own is applicable to many different aspects of the business exactly okay. um and so having that uh opportunity to learn and apply mm -hmm. was incredible because you didn't let kind of information go to the back of your mind and kind of forget about it because once you apply it it somehow sticks Better than if you just read about it or heard about it or even saw someone else do it. Yeah, and that's something you continue to apply, exactly. right? Exactly. In terms of shorter cycles of exactly. learning and applying. Very short cycles. Like, mm. Because at the end of the day, if you have so much information with everything, even now the talk or starting the entire process of being an entrepreneur, it feels overwhelming. And that's because you're seeing everything and you're, you feel like you need to do everything all at once. But in reality, uh, there are small, like you take small pockets of information and then you apply it and you build on that. Um, so, so definitely that's something that translates into everything. Nice. Yeah. Specific outcomes from, the, from actual content. What, what would you say? Um, one that I actually enjoy is uh, the market, uh, when it comes to marketing, how to be efficient with marketing. So one uh, thing that I took out of it was uh, uh, the ability to brainstorm with the team. And we're actually doing that uh, now, where you don't put a ceiling on people's imagination and on what they have to offer. Sometimes you really have to purge everything on the whiteboard or on the paper And after that, you kind of narrow down or you see, okay, that doesn't make sense. Because like, like uh, with information, your creativity can also sometimes seem overwhelming. Like, what should I do? Should I do this? Should I do that? We can do this. Yeah, there's so much to do, but organizing it helps you be more efficient uh, with your creativity and, and have a better outcome. So basically what we do is we... We set the timer for like three minutes or one minute, depending on how big the the project is. Mm. And you literally write everything uh, that you can think of uh, to solve this problem or how do we want to market this, for example. Everything from billboards to like a rocket to the moon and having it plastered on the moon. Like be as creative and as crazy as possible. And then we go and we kind of rank these um ideas mm. so we say okay how much uh, effort is it going to take time wise mm. so is it something i can do in five minutes or is it going to require like uh, one week and then uh, the third the second thing is costs is this going to be like highly uh, expensive or mm. is this something that's cheap and actually costs nothing because we can print in the office and stuff like that and finally uh, that your gut feeling How successful do you think this idea is going to be? Yeah, like, do you really feel like this is, يعني, شيء ما يتطوف? And we rank that, and basically each idea that has the best uh, score are the ones that we start with. So you can imagine how efficient that process is. Just having to take everything that you've learned and uh, kind of literally apply it. Okay. Yeah. Nice. 
Uh, I have three specific questions, and then I'll open uh, the floor for uh, questions. Uh, one is a lot of people, so the idea of P5M exists um, in the US okay. uh, as a class pass, yes. for example. A lot of people would avoid starting a business knowing that there is global competition yes. out of fear that it might come uh, to their country. Yes. Uh, what, what was your mindset or your perspective about that? Well, uh, I think the key here is localization. It's okay. very important uh, to understand your users and the community and build something that works for them. Okay. So, uh, for example, when it came when it comes to P five M, we localized it with uh, tra with uh, showcasing trainers. So here we when we went and we talked to our users, we realized that people go to class for the trainer. It's not the facility mm. or ho however it is in the states. It's actually the trainer wherever they are, even if it's in a smelly basement, they're going to go there. <laughs> okay. So having that understanding and localizing it... يعني, that's your competitive advantage. That's our competitive it. advantage, okay. definitely. And I'm, I'm really glad that you mentioned that because competition is very important. يعني, let's uh, put aside the fact that we are a fitness app, so if we're not comfortable with competition, there's <laughs> wrong. Mm. Uh, but uh, competition, I think, is very healthy to keep people on their toes, to give users um, uh, options as well. Mm. And um, like with any successful business, th there's always competition. And one of my really good friends once said, it's not about who did it first, it's about who did it best. So never underestimate your own uh, in uh, intuition uh, in your own business. Like that's actually your most valuable asset. Your insight and your ability to build the product listening to your intuition and listening to users mm. as well and the community. So that kind of feedback where you take things from the community and build and make it better is I think what um, allows us to stand strong against any global comp uh, competitor, mm. whether those that are have been established for years or those that have amazing funding. Uh, there's something that you add that no one else has. Mm. I, I think a lot of people focus on the first mover advantage yes. and they neglect the first improver advantage. Yes. So a person who starts the business first might have many problems that they struggle to to overcome that you're able you have an advantage to see uh, what they're struggling with and then to make that uh, improvement yeah definitely uh, thank you for sharing that okay. uh, the other uh, point i wanted to ask you about is pricing how yeah. did you decide on the pricing of your packages so uh, we, like everything in the business uh, it comes out of what what is the intention so what is it that we want to accomplish by either the pricing or a new feature or a marketing campaign? And so with the pricing, initially, we wanted to make fitness accessible. We wanted to make it easy. We wanted to remove all obstacles. So what we did is that we had really cheap prices and long uh, validity. That was like, un actually, one was like unlimited and never expired. Mm. But... That actually hurt our users. We didn't end up meeting our intention or our tar our yeah our intention with those prices. Why? Because we wanted people to be more active and to go to classes. But the fact that they had all the time in the world to go to classes mm. made them not go. The fact that it was cheap made it easy for them to cancel or lose it and not feel bad about it. So then we kind of evaluated based on what it is that we want to accomplish, which is getting people to go to class and build on that commitment level. Mm. So even though they, yani, a lot of people start with zero commitment, they don't know what class to do, what works for them, we help them progress and kind of be more committed. So our prices went up to be a, to be a, more, a good uh, price mm. one that's not too cheap that I don't care if I don't go and one that's not too accessible that well it's a luxury I can do it only once every few months it's something that's sustainable uh, same with our validity yeah so uh, these are some excellent points yeah. because for me the takeaways would be 
constraint uh, constraints can be valuable. Yes. So when you say this will expire yeah. in X amount of time, uh, and also the pricing uh, leads your users to to value it uh, value the offering in a different way. Right. And sometimes when you price higher, they actually uh, uh, give it more significance. Definitely, and the, and the sustainability of it. So mm. that's with everything, sustaining partnerships, the pricing, uh, the promise that I said, I mentioned earlier, like when I promise this price or when I promise this quality, it's for the long term. It's not something that's going to change. Mm. Nice. Uh, final question. I want you to tell us a bit more about how you approached your investors. Yeah. Where did you find them and how did you convince them to actually... So I, I like money. that you uh, asked that question because there's two things that I really learned while fundraising. Mm. One is that do not underestimate just sending an email. Uh, you'd be surprised. Uh, a lot of them uh, do not kind of have a process or do not follow through with the process. And that in itself alone uh, sets you apart when fundraising. Mm. So being able to stick to timelines, give them updates, it's... it's um, like with building the business, I don't need to give you something incredible. I just need to be transparent with what we have and our vision. Mm. So monthly like updates on, okay, our numbers went up or went down. However, we discussed it internally and this is how we want to solve it. Mm. That's literally what the investors want to hear. Another one is... Uh, how formal the relationship is. Okay. So initially starting, and I'm sure like if my, uh, that my partner would say that sometimes I kind of go off tangent and I talk about the dream and the passion and the vision. <laughs> I had that same approach going to a lot of investors. They want to see numbers. They want to see like, of course they want to see numbers, but they also want to see the human element. They want to yeah. see you. Uh, so when I talk about why I do this, my passion, it actually connects better with investors than the numbers. Because the numbers look the same for every single uh, business. Uh, but the sometimes, I hope. <laughs> but the, the, the thing that sets you apart is you as an individual, as a human being. And that's something that's, uh, that's happening globally. Mm. Even I remember, I think there was this article by Forbes that said moving in the future, uh, like 20 million jobs will be lost to robotics and artificial intelligence. But the one valuable asset that people are going to be looking for in the future is emotional intelligence. You and your ability to connect and understand other human beings. Mm. So that when you give, when you show investors that you have that element and that you're doing it because you're, it's, it's a passion, it's a drive for you to make this successful, the, yani, that's, that's what they want to see. So yes. that's it. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you very much. Welcome. And uh, now I'd like to open the floor to questions, if you have any questions. Please yes. be nice. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. okay, one second. I'll give you. Hello. Nice to meet you again. Yes. Uh, I have a question for you. What the gaps that P5M can fulfill in the current market of fitness and health and the other thing, what the progress that you're looking for to P5M in the next, let's say, six month year? Thank okay. you. Thank you. So, thanks. So, the one gap that I can think of, like, you know, off the top, not off the top of my head, like the biggest one is the trainers and highlighting the trainers. So, there is no application that highlights uh, tra uh, trainers, especially now uh, in Kuwait, there's a huge trend and globally in uh, single activity uh, classes and freelancers. You, you see a lot of Kuwaiti um, trainers and local trainers, people that aren't coming from abroad uh, to teach. And they don't have a place that combines all of their classes. Like, I'm sure, uh, I don't know, like one of the trainers that I like is Train with G. Uh, so she trains at CP Pedals. Uh, when bad? Uh, CP Pedals. Um, and, and multiple other places. But there's no one place where you can see all of her classes. Book for them and pay online. 
So that's another thing, paying online. There is no online payment uh, solution for gyms and fitness classes on uh, uh, in Kuwait or, or in the, the region, actually. So uh, besides trainers the, um, and combining all these single activity uh, gyms uh, and payment solutions, uh, th those are the three biggest uh, oh, gaps that P5M is solving. Where we see P5M going in the future, it's uh, making fitness accessible and more than anything, uh, social. So something like you do with friends and family that uh, is healthy and will uh, will build uh, good re yeah, any good par uh, partnerships, I guess. Yes, there was a question. Thanks. Yes. Um, first of all, thank you for sharing with us your uh, success you. path. Um, I'm going to ask from a different perspective. Uh, I want to know what do you say to those who are locked in their careers and they want to follow your steps? Um, what they have to do if they have a great idea, but they can put it into action mode, actually? Uh, I would say uh, I'm really happy that you said that. Because th that's another thing that people think. They think that in order to be successful, you need to take a huge leap and risk and kind of go all in all at once. I think yani, just like each uh, success story is individual, I think yani, you can take your own path as long as it's true to you. Uh, you can take step by step uh, and validate the idea before quitting or before doing all that. And actually, I wish I had more experience before starting this, uh, the P5M as a startup um, in order to, to kind of يعني, have, again, more experience, be part, have me, maybe even more like, um, you know, finances. <laughs> Right now, uh, Yanni, when it comes to pricing as well, I, I, by the end of the month, if I'm broke, and I'm like, oh, damn, like, I want a P5M package now. Like, I wonder how many other people are going through this. So uh, take your own path is what I would say. If you need to validate the idea before you completely take the leap, I think that's a good idea. Uh, it's, you don't necessarily have to make that jump. But you're saying that experience is a must um, I, I would say yes, at least with one of the founders. I was uh, very lucky enough to partner, uh, and my co-founder had a lot of experience. So he helped kind of uh, catalyze uh, the growth uh, of the business, and, and kind of I learned quickly from it. Uh, best, um, if you are doing it on your own, then you know you need to dedicate a lot of time or be prepared to have a slow path and a slow process uh, or progress uh, because again the time you're going to put into it is the time that it's that uh, it's going to grow and you're going to ga gain uh, things things <laughs> hey, uh, i just have wanted to ask on your app uh, like you have a, a number of gyms yes right that are with you and uh, oh, okay, and the subscription is paid through the app, right? So, yes. how did you convince gyms to come on and be on your platform? If the subscription, like, like, does it go to you or does it also go to the gyms? So uh, we have a lot of we add a lot of value to our uh, partners in terms of uh, exposure, uh, and one main thing is that we fill up their empty seats. So we're not taking up a seat that's filled or to one of their members. We're saying you have these empty seats in your class that are otherwise going for zero KD uh, hourly. Mm. So give us those seats and we will split the commission for that class, for that seat. Yeah. Oh, okay. So again, we're seeing a need that they have and we're solving it, a problem. Mm. which is capacity utilization, and we're solving that problem. Uh, another question. Do you have any like plans to expand this? Barra Kuwait? Will I yes, inshallah, definitely. Because uh, knowing your vision or what it is you want to accomplish, uh, it, it kind of leads and uh, brings a lot of features uh, about. So 
we want to make fitness accessible and easy, just like like Starbucks, for example. You wherever you go, there's a Starbucks. So you you rely on it, and we want physical activity to be that that easy, something you have daily and you don't think about because it's easy and it fits into your life. So that is the overall goal for P5M. Uh, if that's a traveling membership, yes. If that's uh, different verticals to accommodate your fitness uh, uh, level uh, or where you are, then that as well. Whatever keeps the momentum going. Uh, Anwar, uh, yes. I would like first to commend you on uh, on starting P5M, Thank and you. I uh, I'm actually a start a starter myself of an app similar oh, uh, in that space. Um, I wanted to ask you about a specific uh, point that you've mentioned that early on uh, yes. on the discussion about having a development team in India. Yes. And then later on you've mentioned that you have uh, basically localization on board as well. How, how difficult it is for you to have a development team in India while you need a lot of uh, specifics or a lot of, a lot of details that has to be uh, localized and, and, and Kuwait? That's a great question. So actually, one of the learnings from the MISC program as well is working remotely. So when you work remotely, it, it forces you to be efficient. You need to have systems in place where any time or any person, whether it's a new team member coming in uh, or... Um, uh, or it's overall pro like pro uh, process that you go through on a daily basis, uh, you need to have these systems in place um, to be more efficient. So being at, at the MISC program, I had to work remotely. And even though I'm used to doing that with uh, my team in India, it was new to do it with my team in Kuwait. But it definitely allowed us to be more efficient in how we communicate, how clearly we communicate, and uh, and setting certain uh, things in place uh, to be proactive in in building and fixing problems. So, for example, we have weekly meetings that we do with the team. Uh, the team we we share with them. Uh, our experience here in Kuwait, and they help with brainstorming uh, future features, what can we do? So basically, it's a different relationship with the development team than it is with the business development team. So when you think of your development team abroad, it's mostly what tools are available for me to execute this vision. I want to allow people to be on wait list, for example. How, what's the easiest way I can do that? So that's mainly the communication you have with your development team. So can you're happy at the end of the day. I would say yeah. that you're, you're completely happy that you have a, 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 an outsourced... Uh, or No, no, they're not outsourced. They're in-house, but yeah. they're, they're based Remotely, in another yes. country. I okay. think it, it's defi it definitely works um, as long as you're being efficient and you're setting these... Uh, these moments for you to there check There is no in. communication gap whatsoever. Everything that you communicate with them, they're efficiently dealing with it on on uh, on the pace that you you want. Or do you think that if you were if you were to have a development team in Kuwait, based in Kuwait, with Kuwaiti developers, or at least developers who are based in Kuwait, it would have been easier? Did you uh, ever felt like for me? No, because like I said the systems, the sheets, and the system that we have can work with someone sitting right next to me or someone like miles away. Um, so it's, uh, the, the communication doesn't, isn't easy because it's easy, it's because we made it easy. We, we realize that, oh, uh, wait, I said X, Y, Z, but you made something completely different. Uh, Reevaluate. Where was sure. the miscommunication? Okay, great. It was here. So now let's set, uh, uh, make something in the future. Oh my God, my vocabulary. I'm so sorry. Uh, <laughs> let's uh, set things in. Uh, uh, oh my God. Let's set. Future works. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> future. future. Uh, to make sure that uh, it doesn't. We don't go through this mistake again. Okay, I have another question. Maybe I'm I'm actually consuming you with questions. No, uh, it's basically the gap. Uh, the gap year between uh, the date of your uh, funding the yes. app until you have got 
the the fund coming from 500 startups. Yes. There was a churn. Uh, basically, uh, you're you're uh, burning cash, right, for for a year no. time. I love that you asked that question. So yeah, we, so. to a certain degree, operate lean. So I don't know if you guys l l uh, read the lean strategy. It's a book I highly recommend. It. It's really good. And also you touch upon it on the uh, bo uh, Sirda Bootcamp, Startup Bootcamp. So wow. just saying, hashtag. I love this bootcamp. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the lean basically strategy is that you, whatever resources you have, you use. So, uh, and, and the more resources you have, the faster the growth. Of course, so if we had more money, growth and development and things like that would be even faster. But we used what we had. Were you breaking even? Uh, breaking even in terms... Before of funding, were you? Uh, sometimes. Okay. Sometimes we were, sometimes we weren't, yes. That's good. Uh, because, yeah, I like... Uh, yani that, this also ties into your question in uh, should I leave everything? What resources do you have? And can they take you to the next stage? And once you're in the next stage, hopefully you'll have enough resources to take you to the next stage and, and so forth. And that that is something that you can work with within the business and even as in like taking the leap of giving everything up also. Awesome. Thank yeah. you Welcome. That's for your input. Thanks. <laughs> Hi, my name is Samir. Hi. Um, I just wanted to know, like, after your entrepreneurial journey, um, did you, in, in any way did your uh, spending habits change? Sp oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, uh, I don't know if I'm asking the right question or no. Firstly, that. Uh, secondly, if you're spending more, does your identity help you, uh, he help you uh, doing networking? Okay. Okay. Uh -huh, with the I right understand. people. Yes. And thirdly, uh, how do you maintain um, your entrepreneurial journey, like working hard and uh, at the same time uh, doing self development? Okay. Yeah. So that's a really good question. So, in terms of my uh, personal spending, right? Yeah, definitely. Oh my God, everything is like, well, how many ads can I do with this instead of like, <laughs> instead of like, you know, buying a pair of shoes. Uh, so yeah, my spending changed tremendously uh, because I, I have more like value for money. It's like I can do so much with it, uh, or I hope. Um, so that definitely changed. In terms of networking, if it did, I, I, if, I, if I understand you correctly, you're saying if I spend and look a certain way, will it help with network, networking? If it did, it would definitely help with the wrong networking. It's the wrong type of people if they're going to look at how you dress and what, you, what, what car you drive and equate that with how successful you are. Uh, yeah, I saw this video uh, with... Um, the founder of Amazon, uh, Shisma, I'm so bad with names. Yes, yes, I swear I know his name, but I'm really bad. My friend can vouch for me. <laughs> so um, he, uh, in 1999, w worth billions, was like driving a Honda, you know, and where, like, even the guy interviewing him was like, I don't understand, yani, why? This because it, it, it doesn't mean anything. And so far, I haven't seen, it didn't affect uh, me. I hope I'm not that busted. But <laughs> this, uh, I don't think it had a big effect. And the last question was, um, my memory is so bad. Self-development definitely goes hand in hand. Uh, I'm lucky enough that the startup that I'm trying to build actually uh, is, a, is an exercise that helps me with self-development. Like I said, when I go to the gym uh, and I work out, it's, I'm so lucky because it's part of work, uh, but that helps me learn so much. Uh, the process itself, like whenever something comes up that makes me anxious or uh, I'm avoiding it, it, I stop and I reflect on it. And I'm like, okay, what is about this process that's making me nervous or that I haven't developed yet to be able to be successful in it? So definitely goes hand in hand. Um, doing the nine to, to eight, six and having those working hours gives you the opportunity to do other things throughout the day, like self-development uh, and being part of the community. So yeah, I hope that answered the question.
Thanks for uh, putting on this uh, this talk. It's been very useful, very educational. Um, I also like how you've answered the questions. I think you did them with a lot of honesty, Thank and you really put yourself out there. I think that's a, that's very commendable. Um, I think the first question that I do have is: How do you handle communications between you guys and the gyms? So, in terms of classes getting filled up, if a spot, for example, if they get fully booked off their own bookings, how does that affect you guys on the app? How dynamic? Yeah. is that how do you guys handle that side of um, things and then finally when you were developing the app the first time was it outsourced first was it developed or like, like how how did you get from start to finish because i'm sure it probably had a bit of a journey yeah definitely getting from a to z thank you so no thank you so the first question communication uh well these kind of things come up what's important to communicate and what isn't and we've also realized that through our journey. Like sometimes we bombard gyms with email notifications that they don't need. And they're, they're kind of just like, uh, hey, how do we, you know, remove this notification and stuff like that. And uh, also um, when it comes to fill, uh, bookings uh, being filled, we initially did it manually where we tell them, by the way, this, there's, uh, this class is full but there are users interested. Uh, how about you open up seats? Oh yeah, sure. And then we're like, okay, how about we develop a, a, a feature that allows users to be added to wait list and then the gyms would be uh, notified that someone is interested and if they have extra space, they'll open it up for them. So communication, like with any relationship, is a two-sided road. Yeah. Uh, you communicate based on your understanding and your kind of perception or what you feel the other person needs to know, sorry. Um, and then once you kind of get feedback from the other person, you adapt and evolve and improve the process. So one thing to keep in mind is always um, listen to understand before being understood. So always have that mentality where let me hear what they have to say before I kind of explain myself or uh, and other um, yeah other things this goes with gyms and with trainers mm. i'm sure teammates in the audience would tell me yes and remember that the next time i interrupt them <laughs> <laughs> so that's one what's your second your second question it was, was the, the uh, development yes the application so development. the development was always in house However, initially, when we were when we had the studio and we were just starting it off, it was uh, outsourced, you can say, as a website uh, with Wix. So we used Wix to kind of have the bookings, have everything, and then that's where we put ourselves into the gym's shoes. So then every single booking that we received, uh, we'd have to send a payment link. So... Uh, yeah, it was a no-brainer for us that the second we have the application, that there would be online payments because you know mid mid conversation with or with family or in in an event like this, I'd literally have to be like one second and you know like you know, send a payment link. So uh, I hope I answered your question, but yes, definitely as a min we had a minimal viable product uh, as a website, but once we did do the development of the app, it was in house. And I was uh, lucky enough to have a partner that went through the other direction, and that wasn't the best. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Anwar, for uh, for your introduction. I mean, you answered many of the questions which I had in mind before Great. the meeting. I want to catch up actually on a couple of questions which were raised by, by gentlemen here, uh, mainly on the resources and the financials. Okay. Yes. So uh, you correctly said if you don't have the team at the beginning, you need to do everything yourself. This will be slower, you know. Definitely. Uh, and then you mentioned something that Haider uh, um, asked, you know, how to find the right people. And you said this is really, you know, from uh, any recommendation, knowing people. But wouldn't that be actually more luck thing? Yeah, I don't have the luck. I'm looking for people. I'm doing everything myself, looking for people. But I have actually... Permanently bad experience, exactly that type of people who expect really to tell them exactly what to do, how to do it, you know. So, and that is not the right, right type of people for a startup, you know, because yeah. things is pivoting all the time, changing all the time. So, wouldn't that be luck just to rely? Maybe someday somebody will tell you about somebody good, you know. Is it yeah. a more systematic way to find the right people? So, That's I, my first I love question. that question, yes. Uh, let me answer it because my memory is so yeah. bad, so I'll probably forget it <laughs> by the time. So, 
That's a really good question because it also brings in the, uh, the are you being productive kind of. So of course, if there's something tangible, you can check it off your list and you feel amazing. But surrounding yourself with the right people and the right network and having that, uh, that uh, social interaction after working hours might seem like it's, I'm not being productive, but you actually are for the long term. It's like delayed gratification. Uh, building these relationships with people eventually will lead you to meet uh, team, uh, good team members. Uh, so it's, it's not really luck. It's, it's basically you setting the stage, your daily habits, your consistent daily habits that eventually pay off. And they always pay off. Um, so that's uh, I, so it's not really luck, but it usually, honestly, every single hire that we've made that comes from a, a network, I saw them somewhere, we had a discussion, are the best. That, that However, me, yeah, please. let me just say yes. about the fact that you have to tell them what to do. Some jobs, some job descriptions actually require that. And that was one of the mistakes that I went through. When I initially wanted to, to hire someone, I wanted to hire someone that could do everything. I want you to be versatile. I want you to be Superman. I want you to bring me the moon, yani all these things. Uh, and then some, I realized that, no, there are some tasks that are simple, and someone just needs to be told, do X, Y, Z daily. Thank you, and uh, I'll see you, you know, later. <laughs> my, kind of actually, thing. the way I'm doing things, the things, yani, this is actually I learned from my previous uh, corporate life that actually whatever you can uh, do as repetitive, you can automate. Okay? Exactly. So you don't need so to hire somebody. But I'm looking for actually the type of people you said where, where, where you're, you're your partners. You said so you have somebody for IT, you have somebody for marketing, and these people are actually the people who are bringing the other people and driving the business. So I'm looking for that type of, of people, and it's not easy to find. Which brings but me they now come from other people. They come yeah. from other, those types of people, the, generally, especially as a startup and you don't want to do high costs. Exactly. That's exactly yeah. my second question now. So now what, what about the, the, the funding? So to find these, let's say, perfect people for your needs, you know, you will need to pay them accordingly. I mean, they, they will not, this type of profile will not be sitting on the, on the cafe, on the street, so you need to pay them. Um, but what about your lean startup, actually? And here comes my, my next question, it's linked to it directly. What are you doing with the funding which you are getting from the VCs? Okay? Okay. So where are you putting that money? Is it in the people or do you do have any you? other? Hello? Hi, are they here? <laughs> I feel, no, just kidding. But yeah. yeah um, so the first question is uh, how to be cost effective. There are people, like sometimes, like I said, with experience, you kind of hire someone that you know will, uh, will be has that hunger to learn and will be it has potential even if they don't have the skills and then what you can do is that uh, people that do have the skills you can kind of ask them for uh, more of a strategy consultant okay. and they do a project with you with this new hire for example and they learn uh, kind of that process uh, that's my the best advice I have to be cost effective and to say that, no, you don't need that person that is going to, you know, take up so much of the budget. You really need to under yani, understand, is it going to be worth it? Is it going to be a good ROI or return on uh, an investment? So if there is someone that's incredible, but you can't pay them, maybe work with them on a project base or something like that, along with the hire that you have that yep. has incredible potential. And the beauty about having people like that is they, they are like grateful for the opportunity. The loyalty, the growth that you both go through is something you, you can't really experience with someone that's يعني, already kind of established or يعني, شوية yeah. شايفين نفسهم maybe. <laughs> so, and what about now, what, what, uh, where the air is? Because now I'm also building a business case for, my, for, for, for one of the angel investors. So, oh. but in, in, in my... What in, do I do with the Yeah, money? exactly. So maybe it's, uh, is there, because you, you, you run the business, so you yes. are running the business. Is, yeah. there, is there something else maybe you can share? For me, the main need for that budget is to hire the people. So that's actually the most important. That is a big part of it, yes. Exactly. But is there anything hidden, you know, which you discovered through your journey? Where you think now, okay, now getting that money will help me invest into that area? 
Well, uh, well marketing is huge. Marketing. Um, again, I, w- I was naive to think that the product would speak for itself. So we didn't really invest that much in marketing. Yeah, يعني, alhamdulillah, we are where we are today. But يعني, we did smart marketing or, or like organic inbound marketing. So we more invested on the infrastructure that will get organic users than the big PR stunt that you're going to pay so much money for and then يعني, you never know where it's going to be. Because people here, especially with a, with a, a changing a habit or having a building a new lifestyle, there is a, a, a big level of trust that's required. And that trust comes from being there, being de- dependable. Mm-hmm. So I know that if I you know, purchase a package on P5M or if I uh, interact with you as a brand, that you're going to be with me in the long term. And if you think about it, most of, the, yeah, I mean, most of the things and the businesses and things that come up here, are they come up, they make a big bang, and then you never hear from them again. Uh, and so, th- so I would say marketing, of course, hiring uh, good teammates, and expanding uh, into like different countries for okay. for me at least thank you welcome uh, we'll take two more questions like tools sorry tools, tools yeah. yeah like third party tools that you have to pay like sometimes some need like quite an uh, an investment thank you uh, first of all thank you so much for doing this kind of activi- activities here as we have great entrepreneurs like Anwar and okay. a lot of people who are passionate about <laughs> entrepreneurship. We need this in our area, so good job. Uh, my question is, I like uh, how you market for your app, how you are honest uh, like in your, let's say, instruction and descriptions. Because I studied marketing, and marketing in the real world is different than having a bachelor in marketing. Uh, my question is, uh, do you think you will have that and all the gyms in Kuwait in the future? That's a very, very good question. Uh, يعني, should we be a marketplace or should we keep with uh, the, the quality that we have now? To be honest, initially, I think, uh, and, and for the foreseeable future, quality is important because we are building a, a habit. We need that trust. Uh, being a marketplace is great, But um, I feel like also it's kind of a responsibility to, to even set the stage in the right way. You know, uh, like in terms of what we want the fitness industry to do, represent, how we want people to uh, thi- uh, يعني, kind of change their mentality about fitness. Right now, a lot of people feel like fitness is like to lose weight and, uh, and it's a chore. Yeah. Uh, but we want to we create a lifestyle. And a lifestyle is you going into the gym, enjoying it, it's entertaining, it's, uh, it's, it's really, really fun. You know what I mean? So we want to keep that before we kind of say, okay, Allah, now that يعني, we set the stage and we have a good base, if you want other options, of course, it's not our place to make that judgment or that choice for users. I can't tell you where to go and where not to go. Uh, but at least initially, I want you to trust that whatever is on board is going to meet, meet your expectations. That sounds good. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Excuse me. Good morning, Ahmed Ibrahim. Good morning. The app, I think, is a kind of management hack, supply and demand. Yes. So you cannot do like massive marketing campaign. Then uh, if you don't have the supply, uh, mm-hmm. you, you'll be failing. So the, fir- the first thing, how do you manage that? Well, so the other thing, there can be shortage of demand where you need to do marketing to fill up supply uh, slots, haggle gyms or uh, classes. Uh, do you use any of that kind of data to do that marketing for, uh, for these empty slots, Hegel uh, classes, yes. using artificial intelligence or kind of big data tools? Yeah, definitely. So uh, that's a really good question. We can do marketing with the gyms that we have because our marketing is, uh, like I mentioned, um, 
uh, matches what we have. When we initially started, we did start with one gym. So what P5M is, is that flexibility and lack of commitment. Uh, and, and it fits into your schedule. So even though we have like, let's say, 15 gyms or 20 gyms, we can still do mass marketing with those 20. Because when we do market, we never say all, and, and users have this uh, you know, unrealistic expectation. We say 20 of the best gyms all with one membership. And we do mass marketing for that. But that's a good point because most of our marketing is like uh, organic. So we want to set the stage, whether it's search engine optimization, Google ads, we want to get the right leads that actually need our product. Uh, and that is what helps us be more cost effective. We don't need to put a lot of money to get the right type of user. Uh, so we do use, of course, analytics when it comes to Facebook lookalike, same with Google, uh, ad retargeting. So those kind of things where they say, okay, input the, def the definition of your user, super user, for example, and that's something from our data. So we say, oh, oh my God, yani, mashallah, this user uh, has attended like over 150 classes. She's obviously our, our market audience. So we take that information and we feed it to uh, Google or Facebook and say, bring us more people that look like this. Uh, and that helps us be more cost effective as well. So um, I hope that answered the question. And oh, uh, one more thing. When it comes to our partnership with the gyms and demand, uh, we kind of have an agreement with the gym where there is a, uh, we need notice before they're out of the platform. Mainly because we don't want to promise marketing, promise our users that currently have a, a membership that this gym is on board and then they maybe pull out at the last minute and, uh, and we don't meet our promise. So more our, our, the notice period is aligned with gym memberships and aligned with marketing campaigns. So that way, if a gym is off board and whatever new member comes on board, they have the right expectation. Yeah. Um, thank you very much for your talk. It's uh, very inspiring. I would like you to give us advice of three common mistakes you see startups in Kuwait specifically are doing and uh, you know getting mature now enough where you are you can see that you oh, know you yeah. could have been avoided or you see that some 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 parts of it to be you know clearly uh, noticed that you can share with us yeah definitely so one that i love because you're going to be bombarded with them in your journey is uh, sheets and updating sheets and those kind of things. Sometimes these uh, having so many sheets are actually time consuming. So knowing where what is important and uh, where to kind of put in the effort, uh, whether it's time or cost. So for example, every time you go, you go to a, a talk, you go to a workshop, they're gonna tell you, here's this sheet, fill it out, have your team members fill it out. But realistically, it, that takes up a lot of time. So have these kind of systems come in place based on feedback. See where the miscommunication is with your team and then build the right sheet that complements it. And you'll find that it's actually more helpful than time consuming. So that's one misconception. Two, in that it's not easy. Nothing is easy and it doesn't mean that it, it doesn't have potential for success. Uh, the, the most important thing is to have clear expectation on what the target is that you want. So for example, if you're a social app, having tons of users is your target. That doesn't necessarily mean that you have revenue or money. So you might be disappointed because you, put, you had the wrong expectation uh, and you put the wrong target for what you were expecting. So setting the right expectations is very important for you to feel fulfilled and uh, productive throughout this entire journey. Uh, you'll feel like you're not overwhelmed or you have to think 24 seven about the business because this is my target, I'm, I know what I want to expect and this is how I'm gonna achieve it. Khalas, you don't have to think about it anymore. But if you leave it as an overarching thing and you don't really verbalize it, then 
you are going to be overwhelmed, exhausted, and probably not efficient. And you're going to feel like, oh, maybe this is a bad idea. Where really it's the process that needs improvement. So I guess here in uh, that process and putting in real investing time uh, is what's lacking when it comes to uh, people and entrepreneurs uh, in, the, in the region. Yeah, and it's easy to invest money, but time... It needs, uh, يعني, I guess it needs a certain type of discipline. So I hope I answered the question. Yeah, okay. uh, Anwari, thank you very much for being here Welcome. and for all your thank answers. You. Uh, <laughs> and I'd like to thank you all for attending. Uh, just uh, a, a few quick announcements. So uh, we have a startup boot camp starting next week. And to answer your question, for example, when it comes to should you take the leap uh, or not, uh, we usually advise against taking the leap until you've validated, which is something that uh, Anwar talked about. Make sure that the business that you're looking to build have customers and you can make it sustainable before taking that leap. Uh, I would also recommend uh, a website called side hustle school and it gives you some ideas on how to build a business on the side rather than uh, feeling compelled to, to like jump in to full-time entrepreneurship from the beginning the startup boot camp is actually focused specifically on customer validation we cover all aspects of uh, the business but we want to make sure people are clear on the customer segments who are you targeting and what's your value proposition because that's how you're going to be perceived in the market. Okay? Um, uh, so, yes. Do you, sorry, can I add one more thing to what he said? Yeah, sure. Okay, sorry. One more, um, one more thing for local entrepreneurs. <laughs> I just thought of it. It's I, like I remembered. So, one important thing is a feeling of entitlement. I think that was so important and something that even I had to overcome when it comes to users and dealing with uh, your user base and or partners. So if you feel entitled, every request, every feedback that you get from users, you're going to be frustrated because you're going to be like, it's super easy. Why don't you understand the, 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 the button is as big as my head? You know what I mean? Yani, it's so clear. Best, you have to change that mindset into honestly believing that no one, whether it's a teammate or a user or a partner, would ask you for a question or a clarification if they truly didn't understand. So have that perception when you're dealing with people and uh, they're coming to me because there's something unclear and I have to improve the process to make it clearer. Uh, that will change so much. You're not going to feel frustrated. You're going to be open to feedback. And I think locally people feel entitled to, to that kind of uh, experience. And uh, uh, I feel entitled to you understanding what's on the app uh, or you purchasing it على, على مزاجي. I put this price. Yeah, to me it's correct. إذا مو عاجبك خلاص يعني you know الباب يفوت جمل على قولتهم. ف have uh, changing that perspective for any entrepreneur starting will make the process so much different because you'll be open you'll be you won't feel offended you won't feel like I'm uh, way who are they to think that they can tell me this this button being orange instead of green is going to make a big difference but it does it does make a, a clear difference and having that open uh, comfortable a welcoming uh, relationship with your users, partners, and team will help you uh, avoid so many problems. So, best sorry. Thank you. Welcome. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, if you're interested in the startup bootcamp, you can go to the website sardablab.com hyphen, uh, no, sorry, slash SBC, startup bootcamp. Okay? Highly recommended. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Uh, th that's one announcement. I'd also like to thank TAP Payments, who are our partners in helping us uh, offer these uh, uh, events. And finally, we have Local Beats, the food available there. It's delicious and healthy. <laughs> no, no, okay. it's okay. You have P5M. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Uh, and uh, w once again, thank you all. And
make friends <laughs> thank you